Hello and welcome to another election R&D dialogue from the USC Center of the Political Future. I'm co-director Mike Murphy. Joining me is our director, Bob Shrum, and our special guest, former USC uh, Center for the Political Future fellow, and an old friend of mine, Patrick Griffin. Pat sent me his 14-page bio here, uh, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of skim through. But uh, Pat is the founding partner and CEO of Merrimack, Potomac, and Charles, one of New England's leading integrated public affairs and strategic communications firms with offices in beautiful Boston, Massachusetts, and Concord, New Hampshire. Pat's a lifelong native of New Hampshire. All of us Republicans know him as a, a one of the king consultants of the New England area. He's an advisor to Governor John Sununu. Uh, we worked together on a ton of campaigns up there over the years. He's kind of Mr. New Hampshire, uh, including work for President George W. Bush, U.S. Senator Lamar Alexander, and Governor Mitt Romney. Pat is the author of two books, Pay No Attention to the Man Behind the Curtain and Primary uh, Columns. Uh, also, he, uh, as I said, was a fellow here. Uh, he does regular stuff at the Harvard IOP. He is a TV commentator. You walk down the streets of Boston and People jeer at him. So we know he's on television there in WCVV TV, the ABC affiliate in Boston, Fox 25. You see him on CNN and Fox uh, News nationally and uh, all kinds of good stuff. He's also on the board of one of our fellow institutes in New Hampshire, the Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College. Uh, so Pat, welcome to election R&D. Thanks, Mike, and great to be here. And Bob, it's great to see you again. And uh, what's the fee for this again? Um, we, we, <laughs> we have a coffee mug. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 will coffee send mug. You, I will send you a Biden button. Fair yeah. deal, Bob. I may need that after this election. <laughs> um, so let's, uh, let's begin. I guess there was a debate the other night. Bob, do you want to fire off the first question? And oh, let me yeah. remind everybody before we begin that we want your questions too out there in the world of the interweb. So please um, use the chat function here on Zoom. And uh, when we're, oh, I don't know, maybe 40 minutes from now, 35 minutes, we'll start to uh, ask the questions and make sure you give some tough ones here to Pat Griffin. All right, Bob? Okay, 50 million people have already voted, but last night's debate was nonetheless arguably the last chance to change the trajectory of this race. Biden needed not to make a mistake. Trump needed arguably a Hail Mary. Uh, I thought Trump was hurt because the very first question was about COVID. And he said, we have to learn to live with it. Biden said, too many people are learning to die from it. The other thing that struck me was that for all the pre-debate publicity, this whole convoluted Hunter Biden story turned out not to be an October surprise, but a kind of October damp squid. What did you guys make of the debate? Pat, you want to start? Yeah, you know, Bob, I think these debates are, are always overrated. I mean, you've been involved in this business and you've prepped candidates for debates. You've been in those green rooms, as have, as have the rest of us. I, you know, my feeling is that we, we put a lot behind these debates, that they're going to change something significantly. Rarely do they. Uh, obviously, you can have a Dan Quayle moment against a Lloyd Benson. You can have a particular candidate behave in a certain way. You can pull sound out of these things and drive the news cycle for a little while. But, you know, last night, my sense was that everybody was preparing for a bar fight and a debate sort of broke out, which is, which is unusual given the president and actually given Joe Biden. I, I am stunned by the fact that here we are almost on top of this election. And once again, uh, we're in a situation where America has two very, very poor choices to be president of the United States and leader of the free world. What last night proved to me was this. The president and the threat of the mute button clearly made him somewhat more easy to deal with. Um, but I'm very concerned about the fact that the bombacity of Trump that makes so many people angry and turns off so many people is the fundamental premise for Joe Biden's campaign. Uh, his campaign, almost like Hillary Clinton's was, I'm not him. Now that worked for Trump in 2016, the question is, and Murphy, you and I have talked about this, is the lounge act now tired? Is America exhausted? And are we ready for something, anything, but a president who behaves this way? 
And I would say the answer to that would be yes. The problem is Biden is a terrible, terrible candidate. And for <laughs> moments last night during that debate, I looked at the guy and saw um, what I can only describe as, as a blank, uh, foggy sort of look. I, I don't think Joe Biden is up to this task. Even if you don't like Donald Trump very much, and many Americans don't, some Republicans don't. The fact of the matter is we're given a choice of Donald Trump or something else. And the question is, is the something else strong enough, prepared enough, and on top of his game enough to become president of the United States? Now, I could make this argument the other way. If I was a Democrat or I was somebody supporting Biden, I could make the same case the other way about Trump. My problem, Bob, I think, is as a Republican and a conservative, I have such a hard time with Biden and the Democratic Party's policies that I'm willing to take a little of the baked in Trump craziness because I think the party, the Democratic Party that you worked in for so long and the candidates that you worked for for many, many years wouldn't and don't recognize the Democratic Party that's propelling Joe Biden toward this nomination. I think he's a terrific compromise candidate, but I don't think he's particularly endemic of the energy behind today's Democratic Party. So I'm troubled by this as a voter, and I think many voters are. Do you put up with this stuff from Trump, or do you try something different? And my contention as a conservative is that what we get different from Trump, excuse me, from Trump if Biden is elected, is not Joe Biden. I don't know how long Joe Biden lasts in that job. Based on the way he has campaigned and comports himself and presents himself, I wouldn't take the over on that if this was Vegas. Well, I'd bet you money that he'd be there four years and that he'll do a hell of a good job. And frankly, the folks I work for, the candidates I work for, they're all supporting him. Uh, and what he represents to me is the restoration of normality and a kind of liberal center of politics. You know, one of the interesting things last night was that 538 partnered with Ipsos and they did a before and after uh, poll on people's favorability and unfavorability. Trump's unfavorability is about 60% in that poll. Uh, Biden is actually net favorable in that poll by four points. And I think over time, people have begun to see him as a better candidate, and he's run an incredibly disciplined campaign. But that's okay. You're a Republican. I'm a Democrat. We just disagree. Let's let well, we Mike do. Guess. We do. Right, well, let, yeah, let me, let me get in here and straighten both you guys out. Um, <laughs> I, I, just to do the horse race, <clears throat> this debate was the last handle on the campaign, and Donald Trump needed a lot to happen. So I'll give the president a few style points. He did not show up like an angry orangutan and start throwing furniture around like last time. <clears throat> he literally will, in the Guinness Book of World Records from the last debate, uh, the first debate of the normal series of three, we've only had two because the town hall was canceled. But in that first debate, he won the award for the worst television debate in the history of American politics. That's saying something. I'm, I'm aware of statewide debates where guys show up in aluminum spacesuits. Uh, that was worse. And he hurt himself. Even though he was already losing, he was losing more. So last night, for the, maybe the first time in his political uh, career, which amazed me, Donald Trump took a little advice <clears throat> or, you know, a cocktail or something and took it way down. We even had, dare I say it, low energy Donald uh, last night, but it was far, far better than, than the, the show we put on on debate one. Uh, if Trump had been more like that in earlier debates, it might be a tighter race. I thought Joe Biden had his best debate so far at the time he needed it. Now, again, I grade Joe on the Biden scale of debating. So a great Biden debate is not necessarily a great debate, but with Biden's toolbox, I thought he did quite well, and he got the contrast he needed, which was he has a plan, he has empathy, he's connected to the problems of the country. Uh, well, Donald Trump doesn't have a plan, he's connected only to his own narcissism. Now, I think one of the ways in which Biden has run a smart campaign, and has also frankly been lucky, is that as the challenger, the focus is on Trump. And the country, at least if we believe the polling data, and it's been this way for a long time, is ready to fire Donald Trump. So Joe Biden has been able, been able to avoid, due to Trump's many errors and his antics and the, the, the natural way a presidential campaign normally works, which is a referendum on the incumbent, 
Joe Biden's been able to avoid a lot of scrutiny on ideology. And that has helped Biden. He's been able to avoid it because of the Trump focus and because due to COVID, he hasn't been out in traditional campaigning. And because the media considers Trump so awful, and you know, I'm an anti-Trump Republican, so I get it. Um, Biden's gotten a pretty, pretty light ride in terms of scrutiny with his long record in, in DC. That's been lucky for the Biden campaign and they've run a campaign to kind of leverage that luck. So just to do the horse race, and then I'll let you guys get into the, uh, uh, the, the R&D stuff a little bit. Um, nothing happened. Net, net. Biden might have even creeped forward a little with some nervous undecideds who not quite sure who he is, but no, they don't want Trump. Trump had a few good moments. <clears throat> some of his attacks on you've been there 48 years, 47 years. Why haven't you done anything? Um, I think that resonated with some people. But it wasn't the night Donald Trump needed to turn the race inside out, get back on offense, and, and stem the bleeding that, that's kind of buried his campaign for a while. So I think Biden remains what he was before this debate, which is a pretty strong favorite to win. So where do we go in the next uh, 11 days? I mean, the president's strategy at this point seems more than ever to be to throw spaghetti against the wall and hope something sticks. I mean, one of the things he hoped stick last night was this Hunter Biden story which the Wall Street Journal, while it has an editorial column today promoting it, has a news column debunking it. Uh, what's he going to do? Is he just going to travel the country holding rallies that are super spreaders and go back to the old Trump? And is that going to help him? Let me respond to that because I want to start with who's, who's on the panel here. My friend Bob Schrum is a Democrat through and through, and he's supporting the Democratic nominee. And I get that. And as you said, Bob, you and I disagree on a lot of issues ideologically and politically. My friend, Mike Murphy, who uh, he and I have been uh, behind the, the barricades many times together, is a recovering Republican who is not supporting President Trump, but instead is working uh, for a group uh, that is supporting Republicans for Biden. I want to make sure that given those two clear definitions of the other people on the panel, that everybody understands where I come from. I am a Republican and I consider myself kind of a reasonable conservative. Donald Trump matches neither of those definitions. Never has, probably never will. But I think that as I look at this race, and I've already talked about my aversion to Joe Biden as someone whom I think is past his sell-by date, very clearly, and also who has a party behind him that is not the Scranton Joe party of the working blue collar middle class. This is a different group of Democrats. This is a different group completely. And the fact of the matter is, I just lost my light. Uh, they are not going to put up with moderate Joe Biden for long. I don't believe. So what we wind up with is Joe Biden and a bunch of folks like Bernie Sanders and, and uh, Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren and places where energy is in that party a click away from a fragile Joe Biden. That worries me a bit because I think where the Democrats seem to want to take this country is to a very, very different place, not just than where Republicans want to be, but where I think most Americans are. Having said all that, and I don't believe in conspiracy theories, I don't know where the laptop from hell came from, other than that poor guy that runs that Mac store in Wilmington, Delaware, uh, has really had his life turned upside down. But the fact of the matter is the, 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 the vice president's son is somehow embroiled in all of this. And whether it's real or it isn't real, there is, a, there is a network of people out there who live for this stuff, most of whom are supporters of Donald Trump. Now, what does this do to them? Does it, does it push other voters and undecided voters in swing states away from the president because it's more craziness? Or does it say to the faithful, and this is the political dynamic of Donald Trump, which from a political science standpoint, none of us fully understand. I didn't understand it with Murphy in 2016 when we were working for Jeb Bush. And I've resisted and don't understand it in some ways today, but it's very, very real. Here's a fact. A very good friend of mine who works in the Trump White House, who travels with the president regularly, has indicated that when they do these rallies in different places around the country, and 15 and 20,000 people show up in swing states, they're registering people as they come in and finding out what their voting habits are. Are they Democrats, Republicans? Who are they? 
and they're getting 10 plus percent, sometimes more than that, who claim at least that they've never voted before. Now, I thought all of those people we met in 2016 who elected Trump. Turns out maybe that's not true. What is it that's going on out here? I don't believe the polling is accurate. I believe Donald Trump, to the mystification of me and others, underperforms in these polls. It is not popular to be for Donald Trump. It is not something you talk about in the preschool line or a cocktail party or on the loading dock because you're likely gonna get excoriated. The people for Trump really don't care, but the people who aren't sure and are the last of the swing votes in swing states who will decide this election, I think a lot of them underreport. Now, if that's the case, then all of the data we see in the swing states, which is still close in some places, not so close in others, with Joe Biden at or near 50%, a place Hillary Clinton never got to in 2016, you got to wonder whether these surveys are actually going to reflect turnout, intensity, and in fact, whether or not either side can motivate voters. I don't believe the polls, and I don't believe them only because I think it's hard to even cume a poll these days. You guys know how long it takes <clears throat> to get through a survey on a phone, a cell phone, landline, or internet. It is almost impossible. You have to make hundreds and thousands of calls to cume a poll or a survey that means anything. The question is, who's taking the polls, and do we really know what's going on? And I'm not sure I do. Maybe you guys do. Let me quickly jump in. <clears throat> One on the Hunter Biden thing. I, I saw the president kind of do that stuff last night. The problem is you have to go tune into Fox for four days to learn what all the code words are about because he was right. kind of doing oh, the point. half sentences. I said on TV, it was like showing up in the middle of a model train uh, uh, convention. And unless you know what O or N gauge is, you're not really sure what anybody's <laughs> talking about. I do think Hunter... Uh, is a word known to most Americans. The problem is they think it's a ceiling fan. And barisma is a gum disease your Uncle Wally had. But maybe it'll break through as the most relevant thing. I think the most relevant thing is going to be COVID and getting jobs back. And, you know, we're safe. We're safe. Now, in the polling, maybe. I, I think it's pretty right. The Trump guys are doing what they have to do, which is, hey, we're losing the electorate we have. Let's get a new electorate. So they're out at the rallies and the other things that – they do trying to bring in new voters. I, my theory is they'll get some, but they won't get enough because it's hard for me to believe that anybody who, you know, is into Trumpism slept through 2016 and didn't get on the wagon then. It was a pretty loud campaign. But they, they have data where they say, look, here are all these high school educated white guys who, you know, the, the ones who are registered to vote like Trump, so they will too. We're going to turn them into voters. Much easier said than done, but they're definitely trying, and maybe they're having a little anecdotal success. And just finally, um, the, to Bob's question, what does Trump do now? <clears throat> I think Trump is only winning one dimension of the campaign now. He's winning the optics because he's holding rallies that look like enthusiasm, um, because he doesn't have a particularly, shall we say, uh, stranglehold on the whole COVID prevention uh, uh, technique at these rallies. And so um, it's hard for Biden to compete there because Biden's chosen to play by different rules. And I think one thing for the Biden campaign is how, you know, to figure out how to try to not get beat on kind of the optics of the campaign here in the last uh, last 10 or 11 days. Uh First of all, I don't want to adjudicate the Hunter Biden thing here because it was not adjudicated in the debate. Uh, Biden could have said, he said it's all been investigated. He could have said the FBI investigated it and found nothing illegal. But uh, I do think that Pat's right about what the, the strategy is, if there is one, in the Trump campaign. And that is to get the turnout of non-college educated whites to astronomically high levels. Uh, I think that's very unlikely. Uh, I talked with Ron Brownstein about it and he says, he thinks they're pretty close to maxed out already. And to get more and more and more of those people to overcome the fact that the Republican party has backed itself into this demographic cul-de-sac where it's losing college educated voters, it's losing white suburban women, it's losing African Americans, it's now losing Hispanics at about the same level or maybe even slightly worse than uh, uh, Trump lost them in 2016. Uh, we did do an interesting experiment, Mike, as you may recall, with our USC Dornsife poll, which is 6,000 people 
it's a panel. They're recruited by mail, regular mail. So they're representative of the country, zip code, weighted for education, all of that stuff. And we wanted to see whether there were hidden Trump voters. And the conclusion that we came to was, yeah, there were some hidden Trump voters. And there are also some hidden Biden voters. Some people are saying they're undecided, but in the end are almost certainly going to vote for Biden. Uh, the optics, you know, when I was very young, in and you were really young, in 1972, uh, I was George McGovern's speechwriter. And we were winning the optics of that campaign. We had rallies that were absolutely beyond belief. The, the Monday night before the election, uh, we had a rally in Long Beach, California, where we backed the freeways up seven or eight miles because we had so many people show up. And that was just before we lost 49 states. So I, I don't take the rallies as much of an indication of what's going to happen. And I also think they're somewhat counterproductive because they send a message that he may not care about COVID. Yeah, I think they, they let me quickly respond and then Pat want to hear from you. And I have a question too. <clears throat> I, I don't believe in the theory believed by George McGovern's campaign manager, Barry Goldwaters. I mean, there are a lot of these where rally intensity is the key to who's going to win. It's just the new, the new world we have of politics that wasn't so true then is we have wall-to-wall -wall cable news. And if you turn off the sound, I was joking with my friend Axelrod that if I were to wake up after being dead for 100 years other than reliably voting in Chicago and take a look at the campaign on TV of no sound, I would see Trump rallies and I would see Biden standing around without a lot of people. Now, I don't think that's going to cost Biden the campaign. But if I were Biden, I'd be thinking about how to fill the last week to look a little bit more like, you know, something's going on, which is hard because he, he, <coughs> I just came from a Trump rally, <coughs> but the, <laughs> the, the pictures were good. And if I were Biden, I wouldn't want that deficit closing. I wouldn't, because Trump does naturally have a little more energy. That's one thing at the debate, that Trump is more energetic than, than Joe Biden. My, my question for Pat, and you may want to comment on all the stuff we're, we're talking about, Pat, what do you do down ballot right now? Because if the polls are wrong, great, you're going to win for free. If the polls are right, if you're in one of those competitive Senate races, Cal Cunningham in North Carolina against Senator Tillis, maybe a Joni Ernst in Iowa, um, you know, you're in a margin of error Senate race with trouble on the t top of the ticket. Do you try to double down? Do you try to create your own identity a little this late? What, what would you say? Because the Senate is definitely hanging in the balance in some states where the senators might have a little more grip than Donald Trump does, but they got headwinds. Yeah, no, uh, listen, my concern is not a Biden presidency from my perspective. My concern is a Democrat government, which is where we could be headed. If what we're talking about is right, if this is in fact a blue wave and uh, Trump is, is dragging the ticket from the top down, uh, it's going to make it very, very tough to hold this Senate. And I, I think, Mike, you talked about two of the races. I mean, we really, we Republicans should be very, very concerned about a country that's all accelerator and no break. And, and, you know, look, we're, that's what we're all about here, right? We like divided government in this country. We like the idea, and by the way, we'll correct this in a midterm direct, uh, election. I think we usually do, uh, ask Donald Trump. But at the end of the day, we are in big trouble in a couple of these races down ballot because the problem for candidates is they have to decide at this point you know, if you're Susan Collins, you know, you're pretty much done. And every time Mike Pence flies to uh, Maine, all it does is remind people in Maine, in a place like Maine, why they're not for Susan Collins. Does she cut? Does some of these other Republicans cut? They can't do that. I've seen that happen in other races in 2016. When the Access Hollywood tape came out, when Trump did or said something that was outrageous, particularly female candidates, as you well know, some of them stepped away and many of them got hurt badly. The ones who stuck with Trump were able to sort of ride that thing out and, and glommed on to a phenomenon that I don't think anyone understood then. And I'll be very honest with you. I don't understand it completely now, which is why I'm hedging on this. Look, right now in the real clear politics average here in New Hampshire, where I sit today, Joe Biden is plus 11, plus 11 points. I mean, that's pretty incredible. 
but it's also a place where that, I can does go. it feel like plus 11 there? I mean, you're there. You're oh, out so you're, I, I, over your shoulder. We can probably see a Trump boat rally breaking out there <laughs> on the lake. What, what, what's yeah. your gut having done a million New Hampshire campaigns? Yeah. So here's, and that's a great question. Here's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing um, yard signs more for Trump than for Biden. If you go to the South part of the state down around Manchester, you know, bigger city areas closer to Boston, you'll see more Biden signs, but there's still too many Trump signs to make sense to me. Here's another thing I'm finding, what I call the survivalist Trump campaign. If you were to drive around central and parts of Southern New Hampshire, you will see 20 by 40 foot Trump banners that have been put together, it appears like by survivalists in trees on the side of the road. That's not just enthusiasm, that's an engineering feat. And I'm seeing this in places that are really kind of bizarre. I've, I've seen a lot of handmade signs for Trump. I've seen lots of- uh, Are you they know, spelled Trump correctly? Dressed. Yeah, that's exactly my next question. I've seen Trump in these Rambo outfits, which is somewhat troubling, and flags and, and, and campaign merch. So the answer to your question is, it feels to me here like it isn't a plus 11 Biden state. Now, I can't speak to Florida and Pennsylvania and North Carolina, Arizona, Georgia, Ohio. I'm looking at the same data you guys are looking at. But I will tell you this. I don't think we've got the polling right. I think if we rely on polling too much, we may be in trouble again. And I think the Biden people understand that. But part of this, oh, we're, we've got to run like we're behind and this race isn't in double digits. That's because the race isn't in double digits. And I do believe that Democrats are still bedwetting from 2016. They're frightened and scared, and they don't know quite what's gonna happen yet here either. So I can only tell you in this particular case, every single day I walk or drive out of my house and see stuff. By the way, uh, you and Shrum will appreciate this. Last week on my walk around here, later in the morning, I went by a house right down the road, and there was a lawn sign up front that said Reagan Bush. I mean, there's somebody <laughs> still hanging on to some hope. <laughs> uh, look, Pat, you and I are going are gonna to disagree on the polls and where they're at. And I think at least in our polling, we've taken a lot of safeguards to make sure it's accurate. But the one thing, and maybe we should be holding this after the election, this session. Uh, I've known Joe Biden for almost 50 years. Uh, I have a pretty good sense of who he is, and I think I have a pretty good sense of what he's going to do as president. He is not going to be for Medicare for all. It's not going to happen. He's going to be for a public option. I think his first priorities are going to be to get COVID under control and to get the economy back working again. They're not going to be to do some of these other ideas that people have that I think frighten folks. Uh, I do think we'll rejoin the Paris Climate Accord, but I don't think we ever should have left it in the first place. So I, and, and the one thing that would be interesting, you mentioned the midterms. There are three big exceptions to this in the last century, which was FDR in 1934, JFK in 1962, and George W. Bush in 2002 uh, for first term presidents. And I think so much depends on whether or not Biden, when he becomes president, looks like he's taken hold of these problems and looks like he's making progress. And if he has a Republican Senate and a Mitch McConnell who says, our primary aim is to make sure we, we defeat him for re-election should he want run or defeat his successor uh, should he not run, then I think midterms are probably gonna be pretty bad like they were in 2010. If he has a Democratic Senate and he can, in, can maintain control over his own party, then I think we might be in a very different uh, place. Now, I did find it interesting the other day that Bernie Sanders said he was gonna put out his own agenda for the first 100 days, to which my reaction is, actually, he's like the Al Smith of 1932. He didn't win the nomination, so he doesn't get to determine what happens in the first 100 days. Yeah, yeah I just I wanna interject quickly, Pat, and then let you uh, ahead, respond. <clears throat> I don't, uh, Biden ran when it was politically somewhat painful for him against the single payer plan. Right. I mean, Biden is a moderate Democrat, center left. He's already put out the, in my view, the most mealy mouth plan possible on packing the Supreme Court, which was basically, I don't want to pack the Supreme Court, but I'll 
I'll put out this commission and we're study triangles for six months, get the election over, and then I'll get. So I'm kind of for where he's going to land on that, I think. And he's a traditionalist. So I think, Bob, you know him, and I think your instincts are totally right about where he's at. If the Dems win Senate and House, though, the power of that progressive caucus is not small, and it will take some adroit Biden politics, I think, to keep them bottled up. I may be wrong. They may fall into line like regulars, but the very fact that Bernie's preparing a manifesto tells me that I don't think Biden will get that centerism for free. He's going to need Republican help, and he's going to need, I think, real allies in the Democratic caucus. At least that's my take from the outside. Yeah, and Pelosi, you, will, be, Pelosi will be there to help him out on this. Yeah, without question. Yeah, but, you know, Mike, we, Mike, we've talked about this. Look, the best thing for Joe Biden would be a Republican Senate by one or two senators, because what it would allow him to do is go to Democrats in the House, to Nancy Pelosi and to the Bernie and Elizabeth Warren and, frankly, his vice president and say, look, guys, we got to find a way to work this if we want to actually get it through the Senate. That's the break in the accelerator thing I was just talking about. I, I'm not sure. Um, I'd be very interested to see what happens here, because the problem with Biden is once he wins the election, it's not the Republicans. It's going to be his own party and whether or not he can, in fact, basically say, look, if you don't want me to just be president until 2022, then, you know, we're going to have to figure out a way to, to, to do this in a manner that appeals to more voters than just the base that elected us. And by the way, we're likely not gonna have a Donald Trump to kick around next time. After this election, the Republican party is gonna to have to do some very, very serious soul searching. We thought they would do that in the past. They hold retreats. There's lots of good food and beverage. Everybody plays golf and then sits around and talks about how important uh, black and brown voters are, how important young voters are. And they don't do anything. They produce a Donald Trump. The question is, is there a serious autopsy this time if Trump loses? And does the party do anything actionable about it that really allows them to perhaps be sick of Biden and Bernie and Elizabeth Warren and Kamala, I could keep going, by the midterm elections and make a change? And that I don't have an answer to, but I will tell you that I still think we are, as old George W. Bush would say, misunderestimating the fact that Trump voters and a bunch of unengaged people who, who don't live politics like we do and a lot of people on this Zoom call do, uh, are hard to get to, hard to understand, and hard to see in terms of what their behavior will be on election day. I'm still voodoo spooked, Mike, by what happened in 2016, and I'm not willing to write, willing to write Trump off yet because he's full of surprises. And he's, got a, he's got about, in, in Nate Silver's thing, he's got about a 12% chance to win. It's not a huge chance to win, but it's not inconsiderable. It means he could win. Uh, I'm just very suspicious of quote unquote unskewing the polls, which the Romney campaign did in 2012 and thought they were gonna win the election. But let me, let me move this on because we still haven't talked about what are these last 11 days gonna be like? Is there gonna be a surprise? Is there gonna be something that can alter the, the course of the race? Is there something new the president can do? I mean, he tried to get Attorney General Barr the other day to indict, uh, to indict not only Biden, but Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, which I think, by the way, would spectacularly backfire. I think people would go crazy. Uh, but is there something that can happen in these 10 or 11 days that's gonna make a difference? Well, I'll take a first shot at that. I think the president will flail. The charges, you could tell at the debate, he was getting more and more angry at the end. <clears throat> I don't think he has a lot of confidence right now in his chances, so he's going to try to do something about that. So there'll be new attacks and, and, and new mystery this or secret plot that. The problem is that stuff is kind of baked in, and you can light up Fox, but all you're doing if you're Trump is feeding the 44% you already have, giving them yet another reason to be where they already are. The question is, what will grab a voter who doesn't like Trump and change their mind? And I, that's hard to see, but the president will sure try. There'll be a lot of rallies. There'll be a lot of crazy charges. There'll be a lot of pearl clutching by the media. Most of, it, of what Trump's saying will be kind of at least half to fully untrue. Um, the Biden campaign, a lot of stuff could happen. Uh, one, you know, the, the Senate is highly likely to vote for Judge Comey. 
uh, you know, and confirm her for the Supreme Court on Monday. There, so there'd be a media storm about that. Again, I think that's baked in too. Uh, um, so I, I don't see it as a big number mover, but it'll take a lot of space. And I think the thing, if I were the Biden campaign, other than tactical stuff, like turn out uh, some of the Latino problems they've got, particularly in Miami-Dade County, in Florida is very close, um, and, and other challenges they're going to try to work through. My, my nightmare is waking up with the, if I'm the campaign manager four in the morning with the medical people calling and saying Joe Biden's got COVID. Um, so they've been very protective of him on a health basis, which is good because that would be yet another, I'm not sure how it would work out. Maybe everybody's locked in, Biden's in great shape, but it would, it would rattle the race. That would be another real October surprise. And then finally, you never know what's going to happen abroad that can turn a race upside down. And will, will Trump's erraticness be a problem in a, in a foreign policy crisis? Or will people like the fact that Trump's kind of a bellow first kind of guy and, and, and like the fact that he has kind of the animal instincts and maybe they think that's good against some perceived foreign enemy should that happen. But the thing to remember, and we mentioned this at the beginning, is every day more votes are cast. Because of COVID, and because of enthusiasm, the vote by mail numbers are off the chart. The early vote numbers are very strong. So the amount of electorate that Donald Trump can touch today, best case is 70% of the voters. By this weekend, it'll be 60% of the voters. So election day is about 10 days long and it kind of starts Saturday. So for anything big to shake the race this late, um, time's really running out. Yeah, so here's the thing. The, the Biden strategy has been very clearly, and COVID has, has actually helped this, not just helped it in terms of the country being frightened and concerned about whether the president has or hasn't responded appropriately, but more importantly, that it has allowed the, 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 the Biden campaign to be very protective of the candidate. They're running the clock out. These, these days yeah. with lids on them containing, uh, you know, uh, a call or a fundraising event virtually and then putting a lid on the campaign for the day or multiple days at a time is a clear indication that they believe unless their guy makes a terrible mistake, unless someone asks him a question like, uh, what flavor ice cream, chocolate or vanilla, they're worried that they might create an unnecessary forced error. So to the extent they can keep Joe Biden in the basement in Wilmington, that's worked out to be a pretty good strategy. Very good. And my, my feeling is that the run the clock out thing is great unless or until something like you just talked about, Mike, happens. Uh, the other thing that I would say is, you know, if Trump loses this election, one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, do we really think Trump goes away? Let's just think about how Trump does this. Not just a question of whether or not he's willing to cede power and have a peaceful transition of power, which the Constitution indicates we should have, but more importantly, does he accept the fact that he's no longer president? Hillary Clinton, by the way, never did. That's a fact. Democrats and Hillary Clinton have always believed this election was stolen from them, and they've never accepted it, which is okay. But if Hillary wouldn't do that, she's been around elected politics a long time. She's won and she's lost. My question is, what does Trump do when he leaves the White House? Does he go quietly into that good, good night? I think not. What does Trump do as a leader in exile? What does he do to formulate well, where the party goes? I how think he gets how sworn about, in to testify how, Southern District of New York on a tax fraud case, but you know, or, steering or around that problem. Or alternatively, how about if he tries to pull a Grover Cleveland? Said, I had one term, I lost. I'm entitled to another term under the Constitution. I'm going to run again. Right. And that's, well, I think well, he's going to exactly threaten it. to do that immediately. Whether he does yep. it or not, I think is a big question. And what kind of a chill does that put on what might be the Republicans' opportunity to redefine the party post-Trump? If Trump never goes away and continues to run you know, a campaign from a tower in Gotham, where do we wind up as we head toward the midterm elections? And more importantly, as the party tries to redefine itself in the era after the ice age of Trump. Well, one footnote on the midterm elections, it is a tough map for the Republicans. You got two forces colliding. Right. Force one is the midterms of a new president tend to be good for the opposing party. People want to protest a little. Right. Second, Biden's got tremendous problems to deal with because of the fiscal nature of this COVID crisis. So Biden may really hit some bumps because he's got hard things to do, big political lifts. So the midterms traditionally could be a great opportunity. 
The problem is in the Senate, the Republicans have a ton of seats to defend, which will make them nervous. Two, if the, Repu if the Democrats do win the Senate and there is a blue wave and Biden does well, there are going to be a lot of Republican senators watching their former colleagues' furniture be moved into storage. And that is a chilling thing to go through. In the Senate, it is much more fun to be in the majority than the minority. So the Republicans will be fearful of getting even deeper in the hole, losing some of these harder seats in the midterm. So, you know, it's going to be, there, it, there's going to be, I think, at least privately and maybe more publicly now. I don't tend to buy the conventional wisdom that Trump has an unbreakable lock on the party forever. There was a time when Sarah, Sarah Palin had huge power in the party. And right now you can pay her $500 to open a shopping center. So I, I'm not sure if you lose a lot, you stay fresh. But if you're looking at those midterms, you're Republicans, you don't really want Trump in the way. You, you don't want the half dead fish walking around complaining and acting crazy or pushing his maniacal kids. You, you've got other stuff. So I, I, I won't predict an outcome, but I think it is much more chaotic and uncertain. People say Trump will just put on a crown and rule the Republican Party from New York. I'm not, would, I think that is agree? a backward looking theory. Would you agree though, Mike, that if, if this is a landslide, what by a landslide? I mean, in contemporary politics, let's say uh, Joe Biden wins this by six points or, or eight points. That's a landslide. What is oh, a huge landslide. Yeah, yeah. That means what Lindsey Graham narrow? loses. Then it's 1980 well, in the right. Senate. That's right. But, but, but what, what happens if Trump loses barely, right? It's a, it's a much murkier, reversal. Yeah. It's yeah. much murkier. And I'm reminded of that country western song, Murphy, that I always tell you I like. How can I miss you when you just won't go away? And I think a lot of Republicans will be seeing that about Trump, depending on what the math looks like after the election. Yeah. Okay, guys, can we go to audience questions here? We, we can. We can. Let's see. I've got to back up my chat thing. And again, you can use your chat function to ask questions. And before I do that, a quick commercial uh, at the USC Center for the Political Future. We do a lot of great stuff, help kids get internships put on panels, bring in fellows, do Zoom programming like this, which we've done tons of now during the pandemic. And your help helps us. We operate on a tight budget here. We're fiscal conservatives. And so we have something called the Center Leadership Circle, where you can make a tax deductible contribution and help us with our work. It's all over our website. You can check it out. Just Google USC Center for the Political Future. It supports our mission to bring a civility back to politics where Bob Shrum and, and myself or Bob and Pat Griffin can disagree about everything and then go out and be friends and have a good martini. All right. Can I, Mike, can I add yes, go ahead, please. another announcement? Uh, I want to thank the Rancho Mirage Writers Festival, mm -hmm. our partner in this enterprise and Jamie Cabler and all the folks from the festival who have tuned in today. Excellent. We have a lot of questions, so let's all try to be brief or if possible, if you don't have a comment, that's okay too, even though you get fined from the Pundit League for not bloviating on everything. Question from Anonymous. The common narrative today is that high early turnout in mail-in ballots favor Biden while election day voting favors Trump. Yes, that's what the polling says. Do you think this narrative is accurate? Does Trump have a hidden favorability in early voting or mail-in ballots? Does Biden have a hidden election day advantage? Uh, I think the conventional wisdom is correct. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know about this. Uh, I'm a firm believer if we look at even before the world of COVID, uh, Republican voters are, are tend to like to vote on election day. Even before we talk so much about mail-in voting, the idea of absentee has always been a, a much more effective democratic enterprise than a Republican. Maybe that's because Republicans aren't quite sure. They want to see the ballot go in the machine. They want to click those, those buttons themselves or see the marker go through the circle on the ballot. But I do think that early voting favors Democrats, not, not even an aside from the world of COVID. So I, I would just tell you that if you look at um, large leads in some of these states, you know, Florida, uh, we're looking at mail-in ballots with a, allegedly a 400,000 vote lead for Democrats. That's really impressive. But I still think that who turns out on election day and who doesn't is still going to have a lot to do with what happens here. Mike's point is a good one. And that is that the window is already sort of way open and almost closed in terms of your question, Bob, about what does everybody do between now and the end of the election? I mean, the, the, the car is sold to some extent. 
and I'm not sure how much effect we can have on that. I still don't trust this, and I still uh, think the turnout on Election Day is going to be very, very interesting. We, we don't want to get you started on the metric system. All right. <laughs> um, so this is a question. I think we already answered this, so maybe nobody has anything to add, but, but I'll read it. It's from one of our students, Javier Kaleha Erdman. If Trump were to lose, what happens to the Trump coalition of voters? What can we expect from the GOP in 2022 and 2024? So Javier, one of my former students from my seminar last semester, a good man and a good question. Um, the Trump coalition would likely be up for grabs. And I think we did address this to some extent. What happens to Trump Republicans? Do they become velociraptors? And are they quickly out of style and extinct? I'm not sure, but I do say as we look forward to what the Republican Party does, uh, I think that you have to start to look at candidates like Nikki Haley, a more conventional Republican candidate, former governor, who had a foot in the Trump camp and was able to get out just in time, which allows her sort of some credibility. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure that a fresh start with an old Republican uh, party is necessarily ever going to appeal to some people who remain uh, steadfast in the way Trump changed our politics. One more time, um, like him or not, he's changed the way we view politicians, Republicans, and the presidency, for better or worse. Um, this is a question from Richard Green. Oh, I'm sorry, from Diane Wallace. I skipped one ahead. Biden mentioned convening a group of constitutional scholars, liberal and conservative, to meet and discuss possible Supreme Court changes. Your thoughts? I hate it. What about you guys? I thought it was a pretty good way out of the dilemma he was in. Oh, yeah, uh, he announced that. a position. He announced a position before the end. And I actually think that it's a kind of testing time for the Supreme Court because they'll be coming down with decisions during this period. And if they act in a purely ideological way, they'll help make the case for enlarging the court. Uh, or, or making some other kind of change. And if they make more balanced decisions, they'll make the case against it. I don't know where it will take us. I think it's a gutless punt. Look, it, <laughs> Joe Biden's in an unwinnable situation on this. The bottom line is indicating you will pack the court will appeal to a base he's already got. Uh, the problem is swing voters in swing states that could still swing away, as we've been talking for the last 45 minutes. What is Joe Biden going to going to commence a blue ribbon commission on next? This is a classic example of why some voters still like Trump. Trump doesn't even Trump doesn't take two minutes to think something out. I'm not suggesting that's right, but the idea of Donald Trump convening a blue ribbon commission for anything is an anathema to a group of voters, and I still think it's one of the things the Democrats haven't figured out yet. Only and if the I blue ribbons were the, sashes think, at a beauty contest. That would be I about still it think, for him. I still think the only people who care about this and who think the way you just described are already voting for Trump. And I think a gutless punt was a pretty good maneuver in this situation. I, I think Biden could have got away with saying, no, I'm not a Supreme Court packer. But they, again, they're landing the plane. They don't want to, they're, they're, they're in a position to punt, I guess. Uh, now, here's a question. I'm going to start with Pat on this, but I've got to, I'm going to throw him a curveball. This is a question from Samuel Maskett. What do you sense was the impact of Obama's appearance in Philadelphia the other day? And I want you to answer, you know, briefly, but in the voice of Donald J. Trump. <laughs> Pat's famous for his Trump impersonation. No, that's what I'm going to do after this, Bob. I'm going on cruise ships and I'm just gonna do impersonations. It's gotta be easier than what I do. No, listen, a uh, couple of things. He's very, very weak. He's very weak, Obama's very weak. Uh, but listen, uh, Barack Obama's a powerful force. Watching Barack Obama speak at a drive-in style rally or, or, a, or a, uh, you know, a, a restaurant somewhere. I mean, the bottom line is he's a pretty powerful force. It was kind of awkward and strange for Barack Obama's applause lines to be met with car horns but it's COVID. Um, I find it interesting that someone of Barack Obama's stature was, was, was using his fame and political capital, which to Democrats is, that's sacred, um, to sort of beat up if in fact, Mike, the Democrats are landing the plane. When you bring Obama in, it should be for a closing argument that has some decorum 
and a little more class. I, I saw moments of Obama, even though he was very good and very effective, very unlike the Obama we've seen before, sort of, sort of kind of attacking Trump in a level that I'm not sure Barack Obama had to go to. But listen, you bring Obama up, that's serious. He's the best closer the Democrats have. And if anybody can drive out the Obama coalition, it's the guy who created it. Bob? I agree with that. Yeah, no, I thought he was effective too. And I, I, I did laugh at the joke about, because it's all true. We all know the Republican Party, if, if Obama had pulled 150 for the things Trump line. has and yeah. the joke about you know, the Beijing secret Barry? Chinese, yeah, secret yeah. Chinese Beijing bank Barry. account, he'd be was, Beijing Barry. I thought that was uh, that Obama's was got better funny. writers now, Murphy. Better yeah, writers. no, no, no doubt. Um, all right, question from Richard Green. With the Republicans captive to the Tea Party libertarians, and I'm not sure I agree with that premise, uh, and the Democrats captive to identity politics, I do agree with that premise. So, all right, I'll agree with everything, to be fair. Uh, how do either of these parties evolve to nominate more centrist, common sense candidates in the future? Uh, who wants to go first? I know well, the I'll New Hampshire primary is partially to blame, Pat, so we're getting around to you. I'll go first because that's exactly what the Democrats did. They rejected identity politics in the primary, whatever happens beyond that. Uh, we took a poll about a year out uh, and asked people whether they wanted uh, a white person or a person of color, whether they wanted a man or a woman, whether they wanted someone with government experience or someone new. And they wanted a white man with government experience. And that's exactly what they nominated. They nominated somebody, and, and we've talked about, you know, and, and Pat's referred to it, that the forces inside the party that are more to the left, they actually lose a lot of primaries. And there are a lot of center left centrist Democrats in both the House and the Senate. So I, I would say on this year's evidence uh, that the Democratic Party is quite inclined to nominate someone who's in the mainstream of the party. Uh, whether that evolves or changes over the next few years, I think depends in large measure on how Joe Biden does as president if he wins. I, you know, I, I agree with what Bob said in that Joe Biden was a compromised candidate. The hard work about primaries is the right usually nominates uh, people who are so far right, it's hard to tack to the middle for a general election. Same with the left. Um, but what they did this time is they had a whole bunch of candidates who all represented everything from socialism to veganism, and they settled on Joe Biden. And that's an interesting dynamic from primary where it looked for a long time. Frankly, a year ago when I was out there at USC, um, I think we all had discussions in the office, and I certainly had discussions with my uh, students in the seminar about Joe Biden's lack of relevance back last September and October. It was, there was just this counting out of Joe Biden because no energy, sort of no real place to go, yesterday's news. And look what the Democrats did. In this process, they made a decision in a primary, which we never do. They basically said, we better get Bernie out of here, particularly with him going on 60 Minutes and talking about the fact that Castro was a pretty good educator. That's where Bernie Sanders got himself in trouble. And when they tested that little act, they realize this socialism thing doesn't play well in Peoria or anywhere else for that matter. And that's the point where I think Joe Biden began to become looked at as a steady hand for Democrats, provided they could make sure that they got theirs. And I will tell you, I believe that Joe Biden owes a sop to an awful lot of progressives in this party, and I believe it will pay off. Uh, I, I got a point of personal privilege here, Mike. You're yes. my witness. Did I, did I write Joe Biden off as irrelevant? Uh, no, you, um, you thought Biden would win the nomination and we made a bet about it, which is why you're j grinning like a Cheshire cat. I thought he'd <laughs> drop out at the end of the year. Then I thought he'd lose Iowa and New Hampshire from first to last when I was both betting on both. And I should have bet you but after the New Hampshire primary that it'd be out in two weeks. I think I would have had a bet to counterbalance the one I lost. Uh, but then he went on to get the nomination. I will say this about identity politics. The uh, identity politics has a greater grip on the media that interprets the campaign than it did on the primary voters. Um, there was a lot of talk about how women of color are the most important vote last year, how it, it's all about them. 
But the truth is the women of color did have a lot to do with picking the nominee and they picked Joe Biden, not one of the candidates of color. So sometimes the voters are a little more complex than kind of the cartoonish view the media has about how everybody votes their gene code. And uh, that's something I think for Democrats to, when in doubt, don't follow Washington conventional wisdom. It'll lead you off the cliff. Uh, all right, I think we have time for one more question. And I think we have two left, so maybe we can fit them both in. I'm gonna kind of edit this one down from Sophie uh, Saniza, and I apologize if I screwed up your name. Uh, many are concerned that an appointment of Judge Amy Comey Barrett would mean the overturning of Roe v. Wade, which a majority of Americans support upholding. Do you think her likely uh, confirmation, I'll say, has worked to Trump's disadvantage, causing him to lose white women's, the white women's vote who supported him in 2016? Or rather, do you think it works to his advantage, giving visibility to other conservative white women who feel, uh, who feel, I think there's a typo here, who don't feel represented, oh no, who do feel represented uh, through people like Judge Barrett. So uh, what I do we think, think net net? Uh, net net, I don't think it was the boon that the Republicans thought. Uh, uh, Trump was already in trouble with college educated women, suburban women, college educated voters. Uh, so I don't think it made more trouble, but it created another barrier to them thinking about him. Uh, I will add as a footnote, by the way, and I don't necessarily expect the court to overturn Roe. I think they may chip away at it. But if they ever did overturn Roe, I think the next election would be very difficult for the Republicans. Yeah, I think, I think the court is more political than people think. And there's also a lot of respect for precedent. So the overturn Roe thing, I think, is a bit of a... Uh, um, over over uh, thought of uh, fear just in time for Halloween, but we're seeing there are probably three three justices now who who I think would probably do it, but whether they can get to five, I don't know. And as I say, I think it would have vast political repercussions. Right, and if you look at the history of Roe, it was a political decision. Roe really wasn't particularly strong constitutional law, but the court kind of had to do some gymnastics to get you know, a decision they thought the country would live with without a lot of division. Patrick? Uh, Mike, very quickly, I, listen, I don't think the court overturns Roe v. Wade. I, I think you're absolutely right. I think the court is far more political, unfortunately, than we think it is. Uh, and I also believe that the court doesn't want to touch that. That said, Amy <clears throat> Comey Barrett, no matter what your ideology, is an extraordinarily competent woman. She is going to be, I think, a good addition to the court. And I'm not sure how she votes on roll, but at the end of the day, she should be confirmed. And we'll um, that yeah, was a I agree with you. On that. that was a commercial on our guest. That was a commercial. <laughs> that was a commercial. Well, uh, thank you. I think being three white guys, we've now sorted out the abortion <laughs> issue with great clarity. See, I'm learning about this identity politics thing. I'm, 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 I'm doing an online course. I'm getting better. Um, though here's a quick, this is, I always love to do this. Uh, in polling, what's the most pro-choice group in America? of the population. Is it men? Young men, yeah. young men. Yeah. The most invisible group in, in pop culture is pro-life women who, you know, actually uh, make up about one out of five voters. But anyway, that is a panel for another time. Uh, I wanna thank our, our uh, uh, questioners here for some great chat questions. I wanna thank our special guest, Pat Griffin from the Granite State of New Hampshire where they will control everything again in four short years. <laughs> Um, it's, it bugs me a little that a bunch of French Canadians who couldn't read a map and wound up 30 miles south of the border now run American politics, but that's the way it is. You're and, giving us a lot of credit, Murphy. <laughs> well, yeah, South Carolina too. Ask Joe <laughs> Biden. Uh, and Bob Shrum, thank you as always uh, for your leadership here at the center and for being part of this today.